And then when he got into the dugout and sat on the bench, boom, a big kaboom. It was boisterous and it was, it was fun. But something not so fun was becoming all too familiar to Dodger fans. October heartbreak. In 49, after winning their second pennant in three years, the Bums lost the World Series again. To the Yankees. Again. The following year, the agonizing late season torture continued. On the final day of the season, the Dodgers needed a victory to tie for the pennant. Brooklyn pins its hopes on Don Newcomb. If the big Negro right-hander can take the decision, the Dodgers tie for first place and force a playoff. But in the ninth inning, reserve outfielder Cal Abrams, representing the winning run, got a bit too aggressive on the base paths. Brooklyn's big chance is lost in the ninth inning when Cal Abrams out at plate on a beautiful throw by Richie Ashburn. That was the first moment I ever heard my parents swear. Cal Abrams is out by a mile. And almost like on cue, together, you hear this loud shit. <laughs> and I'd never heard it before. I liked it so much, I started saying it. And a few weeks after that, they explained to me that this had to stop. You agonized over it, but this is the way it had always been. We just couldn't get by. It was a team that was almost destined to be the bridesmaid and not, not be the bride. No one understood that better than Branch Rickey. 1950 was his eighth year with the Dodgers, and though he'd made civil rights history, he'd yet to bring a championship to Brooklyn. At the same time, his relationship with co-owner Walter O'Malley was falling apart. Ricky is not necessarily aware of political things that are going on to his right or to his left. And that is, Walter O'Malley, his partner in owning the Dodgers now, cannot stand him. The feud dated back to the signing of Jackie Robinson. As co-owner, O'Malley had also given approval to the historic signing and had grown bitter that Ricky took all the credit. And Waller was right in this respect. The board had to vote to bring up Jackie before it was permitted to come to the big leagues. I think that had a little bit to do with their animosity towards each other. Here you have the great contest between two smart, clever, forceful men who cannot live together. Absolutely different personalities. Mr. Mickey was all baseball. Waller was all money. If there was no money involved, he was the nice, sweetest, generous Irishman you ever saw in your life. But if 10 cents were involved, you were in trouble. They both couldn't be in charge at the same time. Somebody had to go. A test of wills over a beer sponsorship further frayed the partnership. Ricky does not want Schaefer Beer to be a sponsor for the Dodgers. He doesn't want to sully himself with sin. We called the branch the non-alcoholic Ricky. He was the only one that I know of in baseball who didn't like a good time. And O'Malley is thinking, Preacher, put this aside. This is a lot of money for us. O'Malley got his beer deal, and soon a far bigger prize. In 1950, he maneuvered to become the Dodgers' majority owner, Ricky, with his contract up as team president, was powerless. Baseball's great emancipator sold O'Malley his remaining shares and reluctantly left the team he'd built into a perennial contender. Grant Ricky is exiled to Pittsburgh when he becomes general manager of the Pirates. And Walter O'Malley, free from Ricky, has the Brooklyn Dodgers all to himself. With the Pirates, Ricky would again revolutionize the game by signing Roberto Clemente, the Major League's first Latino superstar. Back in the Dodger clubhouse, Ricky's departure angered his partner in the great experiment. They were friends by that time, and he felt a real affection for him, and he didn't like the circumstances under which Ricky was leaving. We always felt that uh, Ricky got forced out. There was nothing we could do about it. Robinson made no secret of his displeasure and the rift between player and new owner would only widen in the years to come. But O'Malley resisted tampering with Ricky's blueprint on the field. In 51, the team appeared better than ever, cruising to a huge first place lead midway through the season. The scent of a pennant was even sweeter in Brooklyn because the team, a distant second, was the hated New York Giants. I didn't like the Giant organization. I didn't like the colors orange and black. In fact, I, don't, I don't, never have cared for Halloween because their colors are orange and black. Oh, boy, now there's some fighting words. <laughs> the Giants, oh. Oh, boy, the Giants. 
Well, we just hated each other. I hated the Dodgers. I hated everything about the Dodgers. It was exciting to be a Giant fan in Brooklyn because everybody else was a Dodger fan, and these arguments got personal. They really got, you know, you're hot and heavy and you're ready to fight. Or worse. In 1938, a Dodger fan named Robert Joyce was so enraged by two men arguing with him about the rivalry, he shot them dead. The Dodgers and Giants were baseball's Hatfields and McCoys, hostile factions from the same city in the same league who battled each other for decades. It was a war every time they faced each other. When you're playing the Giants, your manhood's on the line. And if you want to hear Dodger fans scream bloody murder, play bad against the Giants. But what really put the gasoline on the fire was Leo DeRocher, the Dodger manager, now becomes the manager of the, of the hated Giants. One of the most surprising moves in baseball history. Arch giant rival one day, today manager of the Polo Grounders. When he went to the Giants, he was a double-crosser. Where you are, how could you do this to us? You dirty double, he went to the enemy. DeRocher is hopeful of doing two things, winning the National League pennant and beating them bums. DeRocher was one of those guys who could gather his players around and go, everybody hates us. It's us against the world, especially those guys in Brooklyn. Don't embarrass me. But that's exactly what was happening in 1951. By mid-August, Brooklyn had a massive 13-and-a-half game lead on the Giants. With a 13 and a half game lead, it was, it was comfortable. I just remember cheering and thinking, oh, this is the year, this is the year. Until everything started to change. The Dodgers cooled off, and the Giants went on a remarkable streak, winning 37 of their last 44 games. The teams finished the season tied, meaning a best of three series would determine who would go to the World Series. The Giants won game one in Brooklyn. The Dodgers took game two at the Polo Grounds. A deciding game three was set for October 3rd, 1951. Out of the subway into the polo grounds pour fans by the thousands for the sudden death game in the playoff between the faltering Dodgers and the stretch running Giants. New York is baseball wild over a climactic wind up to a pulse tingling National League pennant. They had just laid the cable that allowed them to broadcast events live out to California. So for many people, this was the first nationally broadcast television event they ever saw. Before the game in the Polo Grounds parking lot, Gil Hodges bumped into Giants third baseman Bobby Thompson. Bobby said, Gil, I'd like to say goodbye to you now because we may not get a chance after the game to wish each other a happy offseason and good health. It's because one of us is going to be walking away from here very happy. Heading into the ninth inning, it appeared that would be Hodges and the Dodgers, as Don Newcomb was sitting on a three-run lead. Sure, you're going to win it. There's no doubt about that. We were already celebrating. I thought it was over, 4-1, the bottom of the ninth. But it wasn't over. The Giants scored a run, cutting the lead to 4-2 to two with two men on base and Bobby Thompson representing the winning run due up. A fatigued Don Newcomb had had enough. To save the game, the Dodgers would rely on reliever Ralph Branca. We each gave each other kind of a pat on the back and a hug, and, and I said, I'll get him for you, Newt. The fans sense the drama of the situation. Branca has to pitch to Bobby Thompson, who homered off him only two days ago. Yet on the first pitch, I just blew it right down the middle. Bobby Thompson takes a strike call on the inside corner. And the next pitch, you know, I threw up and in, and I saw the ball, I'm going, sink, sink. You could tell, even on the radio, by the sound of that ball hitting the bat, that it was gone. There's a long time, I'm going to be in the lead. The Giants win the pennant. The Giants win the pennant. Everything within reach, and suddenly, gone. And it was just a uh, bing, boom, there it went. greatest thing that ever happened to me in my life. I have two children. I'm very happy when they were born, but they never brought the excitement that Bobby Thompson's home run did. You cannot imagine being a Giant fan and seeing that home run. And Bobby Thompson's feet hadn't hit home plate yet when I was already out the door running to the luncheonette to give it to my Dodger fans friends. I couldn't wait to get to the corner and stick it to them. And all I can think of <laughs> was that famous line, one of us is going to walk away from here very happy.
first thing I saw was they're hustling the champagne cases out of our side where we were ready to celebrate. They're taking everything out. They put it into the giant's uh, dressing room. Jackie was one of the first to come in. He takes his glove, wads it up, and fires it into the back of this metal locker. And it made a resounding sound. Dressen eventually comes in, the manager, takes his shirt, and he doesn't unbutton it. He pops all the buttons. Oh, that was terrible. It's like being at the in the morgue. Branca comes in, flops himself down on the steps that went up to the trainer's room. Nobody came near me and said anything like tough luck or hang in there. You know, here went the pennant down the drain, a big lead, and, and you know, I'm now, I'm going to be labeled the GOAT. Ralph Branca got all the blame for losing the game, giving up Thompson's home run, but it was a team loss. I think we realized that after a while. It just wasn't that one pitch that did it. We hate to face our fans after that. It was horrible. It was horrible. The whole borough went into deep depression. I mean, there were suicide lines at the Brooklyn Bridge. You had to take a number. Black towels, black sheets were in all the stores. And we mourned that day. The pain was so great that on the radio, Red Barber resorted to reporting casualty totals from a very different sort of conflict. It said 153 people died in Korea last week. Put it in perspective. Put it in perspective. Didn't work, <laughs> but he tried. From that moment on, I've never watched a baseball game again. Thompson's shot heard round the world remains the most famous moment in baseball history. It does have false feet. It's got a, a clay bottom. 50 years later, revelations that the Giants had set up a hidden telescope in their center field clubhouse to steal signs from opposing catchers raised questions about their late season drive and Thompson's home run. The Giants just stole a pennant. I mean, it's, it's documented that they stole a pennant. But in 1951, None of that mattered to Dodger fans, whose only solace came in the form of a four-word phrase that reflected the eternal resilience and spirit of the Borough of Hope, a phrase that would forever be part of Dodger lore. Wait till next year. Wait till next year. Wait till next year. Wait till next year was 